this New York Times exclusive from last night continues to dominate the news and our conversation tonight. And we now know that when President Trump decided to fire special counsel Mueller, it was White House counsel Don McGahn who ultimately stopped him. As the Times first reported it, quote, after receiving the president's order, repeating order to fire Mr. Mueller, the White House counsel Donald McGahn refused to ask the Justice Department to dismiss the special counsel saying he would quit instead. It's not the first time the people around this president have stepped in to stop something that could cause great damage to him or the presidency. But while the president's staff tries to control the message, President Trump has made it quite clear he sees himself as his own spokesman. I presented to the president my concerns and those of Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein about the ongoing leadership issues at the FBI as stated in my letter, recommending the removal of Mr. Comey. What I did is I was going to fire Comey, my decision, it was not. You had made the decision before they came uh, in. The I, I was going to fire Comey. He's uh, very definitely changed his uh, attitude towards the DACA issue and even the wall once we uh, uh, briefed him when I was at DHS. And what we need is we need the wall, we need security, we need security at the border, but we also want to solve a tremendous problem on the southern border, which is crime. We need a wall. The habit of the president's raises questions about his relationship with his staff, his legal team at a sensitive time as he prepares to answer the special counsel's questions. With us to talk about it tonight, Amber Phillips, political reporter for The Fix at The Washington Post, Brian Bennett, White House reporter for The Los Angeles Times, and Sahil Kapoor is back with us here in New York, national political reporter for Bloomberg. Welcome to you all. Amber, what is the concern level? I'm guessing you get asked this a lot, especially among Republicans whose names have to be on ballots in a few months. Uh, yeah, you're saying what is the concern level, which is the chaos in the White House right now? <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I, it, it is it is an 11 out of 10. Uh, I think that day to day and we saw with a couple weeks ago on immigration policy making is a total mess with this president. Uh, you know, they, they don't know where he is on negotiating or what he wants. But in addition to that, you have a president who has for the past year an uncanny ability to create drama and including massive legal drama like this story right when Congress doesn't want to talk about it. I I mean, they're hoping that this week we were talking about Trump and Davos and and I'm um, talking about how good the economy is doing and the tax bill. Uh, another another incident I remember last year was right as the Trump, as the House Republicans passed a bill that would allow Trump to crack down on sanctuary cities. He tweeted about an MSNBC morning Joe host and, and, and her the you know, accusing her of getting her, her face redone or something. Um, it's just, it's like that day after day after day that Republicans are just banging their heads against the wall with this president because they don't know what's going to come out of him and then his Twitter feed. Brian, indeed, David Gergen, who is in Davos tonight, was saying the president had actually a pretty good outing and gave a half-decent speech to a half-decent uh, reception. But, of course, everything was against this backdrop of the conversation we're having right now. Knowing what we know about Chris Ray, knowing what we know about Don McGahn, talk a little bit about the consequences of serving this president president. It, I guess it's not for the faint of heart. No, it's not. And a number of, of its aides, especially the ones who've tried to bring order to the White House, like John Kelly, for example, have, have really struggled, especially in the last few weeks, to, to keep the reins on the White House and the decision making that's going on there. I was in John Kelly's office on Wednesday night when all of a sudden the door burst open and in comes Donald Trump and we start asking him questions and he blows the lid on a, on a planned four day rollout of his immigration plan, tells all the reporters that, and I'm standing next to John Kelly and I can tell by his body language that he you know, realizes he's going to have to go back to the drawing board and he's going to have to come up with a plan to clean up uh, what the president just, uh, just did. Uh, also, I heard uh, John Kelly, when we asked President Trump about Mueller and whether he'd be willing to testify, and, and President Trump said uh, that he would love to, I heard a sigh from 
Mueller uh, from uh, <laughs> from John <laughs> Kelly standing next to me. He was really trying to to keep a straight face and not show any emotion. But this happens time and time again, where uh, Kelly's been brought in. He he really tries to organize the way that the president gets information and come up with a systematic way for him to make decisions. But the president undermines that um, day after day after day. So Hill, did you find it um, curious or notable that John Kelly, chief of staff to the president, president stayed behind on this trip? Well, there's certainly a resistance among the president to being managed. Um, I'm not sure that necessarily had to do with, uh, that, that Kelly's decision necessarily had to do with this. There were some indications that he might not have gone either way. But the president's resistance to being managed, I think, overshadows any and all strategic imperatives of his that messes up policy plans, messes up negotiations with the Hill, as Brian just talked about, uh, about the immigration rollout. The rollout was plan like, for Monday. He clearly had just come from a briefing on it and just spewed what he had learned. Exactly. John Kelly, who uh, has some inherent tension with the president as someone who lives and breathes structure as a retired uh, Marine general, and the president is a spontaneous, freewheeling individual. Uh, one anecdote from the campaign trail, I think, uh, that, that I can share, it speaks to this a little bit. There was one staffer uh, for then-candidate Trump who would write some statements and speeches and, and things for uh, Trump in speeches. Trump did not want to use that material when he was on staff. When the staffer left, Trump started to use those items uh, more often in his speeches and his statements. It just kind of reflects that he doesn't like it when other people steal his thunder. He doesn't like it when other people seem to be taking credit. Uh, one of the differences between Steve Bannon and, and Stephen Miller, for instance, uh, uh, someone of the, same, uh, of the same mindset on the issue of immigration, at least. Bannon uh, went off the reservation. He kind of made things about himself. He started taking credit for things. Mm -hmm. so Miller doesn't do that. Anytime he goes on air, it's always about how wonderful the president is and how, uh, how much of a genius he is. They, he, they read the, the prime directive well.